Who is the heir to Johnny Cash's throne, the rockabilly punk poet who's still releasing great music today? Let's drop the needle on that question and talk about what he means to us as fans. Hey, Music Junkies, Professor of Rock here with your latest pop fix. As you know, each and every week we go in depth on the greatest songs with the artists and the writers who created them. So in 1992, I was a freshman in high school and I was at the height of my music discovery, having found punk and new wave a few years before and having my mind blown with every new revelation of soul altering music. Because I was in this place, um, I wanted to, to get every CD I could get my hands on. And so I signed up for, I mean, back then you have to realize that CDs were 18 bucks. You know, 16, 17, 18 bucks per CD. We made about 350 an hour, 380 an hour as minimum wage. I mean, we would have to work four or five hours to earn enough to buy a CD. So unlike Spotify, where you have thousands of songs, you know, at a click, well, millions of songs, you really had to go out and buy the album, hope you bought the right album, and you'd listen to every song because you just didn't have that much access to music. Our version of Spotify was Columbia House. You guys remember Columbia House. It was like, send in a penny and you'd get 12 CDs for a penny. Actually, that wasn't true. The fine print, you had to buy like six to seven albums at regular price, which was like 26 bucks plus shipping and handling. And that's how they got you. But you'd be able to get 12 CDs or eight for the price of one or something like that. And, uh, and you go after it. So I signed up for Columbia House, that 12 albums for a penny deal, under about like eight or nine different aliases in order to build my collection. I mean, I was completely addicted. I had so many accounts with Columbia House that I'd sometimes forget to stop them from sending the album of the month or the, the pick of the month. One day, I received in the mail that glorious brown CD-shaped envelope in the mail and I quickly tore open the cardboard to find an album cover that instantly packed a punch. I mean, it was of Mike Ness in midair with his Gibson Les Paul. It was 50% rock and roll, 50% punk attitude. And I was completely intrigued to say the very least. So from there I had to rush off to my summer job and, but I was, I was reading the latest issue of Rolling Stone a little while later, and my hero, Bruce Springsteen, mentioned that he loved Social Distortion and the exact album that I'd just seen. It was a sign. I mean, the gods wanted me to hear this record. It was a revelation. That rootsy, hard-hitting, punk-laced rockabilly with that subtle twang of classic country was exhilarating to my ears. I mean, Social D was like a punk rock version of the Stones with a dollop of Hank Williams and Johnny Cash, yet completely new. I mean, I, I, I don't know why, but I could really relate to the born to lose sentiment and it, it would influence me for the rest of my life as I heard more. Mike Ness is the prophet of rockabilly punk. He's always lived by his own rules and he's created art on his own terms, which is why his music has been the backbone of so many people's lives. I mean, the bottom line, it's real, it's authentic, it's truth. Mike wears the crown that was once worn by Johnny Cash, in my mind. I mean, he speaks for the working class, for the, the downtrodden, the hard luck, born to lose, disenfranchised men and women of this beautiful country. His words aren't about doom and gloom necessarily. They're about redemption. They're about taking the great burdens of life and rising above those circumstances. They're about hope and faith that are emblazoned by the fire within us. Not only is he the prophet of Rockabilly Pump, he's the chairman of, of Cowpunk. He's the king of Orange County and one of the last grand poets of this fertile heartland, America. I was fortunate to sit down with Mike Ness for over an hour and discuss his incredible music. So go check it out right now, professorofrock.com. Here's a little preview for you. We make great records, but our, we take our pride in our live performances. Right. Oh, because yeah. people are there, they've paid money, it's Saturday night, they've been working hard all week, they want a freaking show. 
and you got to yep. deliver. And, you know, that's just something, that's something from the punk scene that I held on to. I held yeah. on to the rebelliousness. I held on to the angst. I held the on hunger. to the anger, the hunger, the yeah. honesty. And I just blended it in with yeah. some other shit. But, yeah. you know, the most important thing about this record, this was about taking a risk. When you're creating something that you haven't heard it before yourself, there's a chance it could fucking dive bomb, you know? Oh, yeah. I had no idea if people were going to like Story of My Life, Sick Boys, Ball and Chain. I had no idea. I, in my mind, I was doing something new, and I was just being true to myself, and I was creating something. You know, I just had to believe in myself. I wrote a record that I liked and hope, hoped that other people would like it. And I kind of still do that. Again, go watch the full thing at professorofrock.com and tell us what you think in the comments below. Make sure to hit the subscribe button below to help us build this community, help us keep the music, the great music alive. Till next time.